Okay. So Al and I are co-chairing the community engagement core together. And so today I'm gonna to walk you through very briefly some of the initiatives that we're doing. Um, we're gonna start out with focusing mainly on COVID and sort of how COVID has really changed the ways in which we're working with different groups and then highlighting some of the innovative approaches that we've been doing, some of our new collaborations, um, some of the synergies with workforce and um, the different career groups here, and then how we're measuring success in some future plans. So um, Ray mentioned earlier the RADx Up supplement that we have through the Community Engagement Core, and so I wanted to just tell you a little bit briefly about that. It's a so RADx Up is actually Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics, and the Up stands for Underserved Populations. So um, there was a pot of funding through NIH that was currently $234 million that went out to uh, multiple institutions across the country. There were seven CTSA sites that actually received funding through it, and we were one of the seven CTSAs. Um, so Duke is the coordinating center for it, and you can see we're in good company with Ohio State Medical College of Wisconsin, um, University of Kansas, uh, UT um, Health Science Houston, and then also University of Utah. The project that we proposed for this project really leverages sort of all of the best and the worst to use sort of Bob's um, imagery from his talk. Um, from New Jersey and from Rutgers. And so our approach to this is uh, we basically got a $5 million grant to look at COVID testing within our underserved Black and Latinx communities here in New Jersey. And we're focused uh, primarily on uh, Passaic, Union, and Essex in Middlesex counties because those are the counties that flank our academic medical, uh, medical center and also have the highest COVID, the highest poverty rates, and then also high um, populations of Black and Latino um, groups. And so what we're proposing to do over the course of the next two years are two things. We're actually developing a community outreach strategy in conjunction with the community and with healthcare workers. Um, one of the things that we found in the cohort study is that um, there, there are a high proportion of our Black and Latino um, members who are serving in uh, positions that are hourly, that are low paid and are also exposed to COVID. They had higher COVID rates and uh, have concerns about their family members. And so what we're testing is a community-based organization strategy in comparison with a strategy that's leveraging um, healthcare workers and having them help us to get to their family members into their communities. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the collaborations that have come out of this and how we sort of move this forward. So this is actually a massive project uh, to be able to put together. And so I'm the contact PI on it and I'm working in conjunction with five other PIs who we all bridge sort of the, the health sciences in different ways. So we have a community engagement arm that's myself, uh, Diane Hill, who's the vice chancellor for community partnerships in Newark, and Manny Jimenez, who's a pediatrician here at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and works primarily with Latino populations around readiness to read. So that's our community engagement arm. And then we're working very closely with Ray and Marty Blazer and Emily Barrett. Um, who have really leveraged the cohort study and have gotten the infrastructure off the ground um, around sort of the saliva-based saliva testing that we know here at Rutgers um, is, has been really sort of moving forward and groundbreaking in the area. So what we proposed for RADx Up was to really leverage our network of networks and to work with groups to co-design an approach where we're going to community and we're working with the groups to understand how do we think, how are our communities thinking about COVID? What are their barriers? How do we address them in a meaningful way in an outreach approach? And then um, co-create with them a, a toolkit that they can disseminate through their organizations and then uh, move forward with um, testing. And so the second half of this is a testing program where we're gonna be focusing in on 2000 participants 
And the goal is to be able to test them within the safety of their homes and to be able to leverage the Rutgers saliva based test in that way to see if we get better uptake around testing. So really important work and really important as we're seeing surges that are moving forward. Um, this slide sort of shows you some of the complexity of the groups and also the stakeholders. So we're working with healthcare workers who um, are affected. We have a design team in that area. We're working with healthcare organizations, which I'll get to in our next slide. We're working with 16 community-based organizations across the four counties. And as well, we have a citizen science, um, citizen scientist team that we're working with and a scientific advisory group who are all giving us input as we move this initiative forward. Um, this slide just sort of um, gives you a sense of the different groups that we're working with. So um, again, um, through Al's connections with Parker Health, which is a, a, a group that's got multiple nursing homes across the Middlesex County area, and then also the Visiting Nurse Association, um, group that has a health, a health, home health aides and um, work through the entire state of New Jersey to provide support for hospice care. Um, those are our two healthcare partners and the, the groups that we're going to be working with to leverage the healthcare worker intervention in addition to our cohort study group. And then um, our community-based organizations sort of run the gambit from faith-based organizations. Um, we have organizations that are community-based. You can see here we have NAACP, New Brunswick Tomorrow, Aspira. So we have an, uh, PRAB, Puerto Rican Action Board, as well as a program for parents. So we have a very large life course approach and we're looking at pediatrics up to the elderly in terms of um, who's eligible for this study. So again, massive undertaking. We're really excited about this program and moving it forward. Um, some of the other things that we've been doing just to give you a sense of where we're at with community has been um, that we really had to change the way that we do things. So we had done this fantastic kickoff meeting last October that had over 100 people at the Rutgers Club and we really had to pivot to more virtual meetings like this. And so some of the things that we've been doing to answer the questions and the needs of our community have been twofold from our academic community. Um, there have been calls to really sort of think about systemic racism. How do we address it? How do we have meaningful conversations with academics that translate into community action? And so one of our KL2 scholars, Kiana Brown, actually, who's in the School of Social Work, came to our core and we partnered with them on a Twitter chat that we did back in June that actually was quite successful, generated over 2 million impressions, had 564 participants and um, over 700 tweets that actually occurred on the day just around the topic. So highly engaging for our academic communities and highly engaging in terms of our, um, our trainees. The other way that we've been sort of moving forward virtually has been to do what we're calling virtual community conversations. And so through the summer and moving into this RADx up application, we had been doing uh, Zoom chats very much like this with community groups and community members to better understand sort of what the issues were around COVID and how could we be supportive in our role as a CTSA and a community engagement core. Um, in addition to those sort of virtual pieces, we've also been doing what we're calling community engagement salons. So you can see that down at the left hand side. And those are uh, very small groups, again, on Twitter, where we have either investigators who have a question that they want to get community feedback on. And so we convene a variety of stakeholders to work with them on that. So we've been working with some people who've been putting in career development awards to multiple NIH institutes um, for through the engagement salons. And then as well, um, we're continuing along with our other programs that we started last year, such as our innovation program. So last year, we were able to give out five awards through our partnership and innovation accelerator program. And then this year, we partnered with the chancellor's office to, to help them with their advancing health equity and social justice pilot grant program. So over the year, we now have uh, 10 groups who have been awarded funding 
all of these groups um, got, got lots of feedback about their grants. It was peer reviewed um, and peer meaning in addition to academics, we also had community partners who looked at the applications and gave feedback. So even if they didn't get funding, they got feedback from a variety of different resources and supports. Um, this slide just shows sort of all of our different collaborations. And so the big blue balls here are the groups that we've been working very closely with um, across the, the RADx Up uh, application. In addition, we serve on the advisory groups for the T and the K. And I mentioned some of the work that we did with Kiana Brown and some of the other mentees in the K. Um, and then the blue balls are the areas, I'm sorry, the gray balls are the areas where we're looking to sort of develop as we move along. Um, while we do have pilots that we provide through our core, um, we've had less involvement with some of the other pilots and we're looking forward to engaging with people as they're sort of developing those projects moving forward. Um, so just really quickly, this is a super busy slide, but um, just in terms of how we're thinking about success, We've really been focusing in on what is impactful. And so um, the partnerships that we forged through this RADx application um, are, have been like a, a really sort of shining beacon in terms of the work that we're doing and what we think is important in terms of bringing in community, bringing in healthcare stakeholders at the beginning and the concept and really helping us to develop it as we moved it forward. Um, we had a really overwhelming outpouring of people who were interested in the granting mechanism. So we had 25 applications and were able to award um, one out of five. So we we're excited about that. We've had some publications and papers which are listed here and we have a poster that's gonna be on display mm -hmm. next week at the uh, ACTS meeting. Um, so our future plans at this point are to continue everything that we're doing with the people that we have. So we have a, a small but mighty group of um, staff who are working with us, four who are sort of in various stages of part-time to full-time with us and then bringing on individuals as we need to, to build out programs. And so we're continuing to grow our network of networks and as well working with groups that are providing citizen science training locally, such as the Cancer Institute, but then also networking with the other CTSAs to make sure that we give access to our constituents here to some of the stellar programs that are available and we grow our own cohort of citizen scientists. So with that, um, I think we can take questions and Al is actually gonna handle that piece of this. So I'm going to be Vanna, Vanna White, uh, so yeah. I will take questions. Well, uh, Sean and Al, that's yeah. fabulous. I mean, that's service with a capital S in bold. So we appreciate the enthusiasm and energy and also the platforms moving forward. I'd like to see, as we all know, those blue balls get colored sure. in, and they get converted to another color, uh, not red or blue. Uh, but in any case, uh, we'd like to build on it. Uh, any quick questions for Shauna? Well, one of the quick questions was whether the Radix work could actually lead to work in vaccines uptake. And the answer is absolutely. That's the plan. It's a great question and it's definitely a trajectory. Yes. Yeah, well, we, you know, we, at this point, we finished the Moderna. We were a site for the Moderna trial where our sites were J&J &J and actively recruiting. If people want access to a vaccine, sign up. Um, you know, we're probably just thresholding into the hundred uh, of people into that study. I think moving forward, getting vaccines accepted for ethnic and racially diverse populations and the vulnerable populations, is going to be a large lift. And yeah. so I, I hope that Radix, that Radix Up is going to give some confidence that when we go back and say it's time to get vaccinated, we could be impactful. I, I really hope that that's the case, but we, we unfortunately carry a legacy of, um, of not being able to touch that incredible population. Thank you. No comments, let's move on. Um, biostatistics, uh, Bird, uh, Jason, you're on. All right, great. I'll get some slides up here. Okay, you should see a full screen here. If not, let me know. 
Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about BIRD. And, and just as a quick reminder of who we are, the, I'm Jason Royce. I'm a, one of the co-directors, co along with Perry Halkidis, who's the Dean of the School of Public Health at Rutgers. And then we have a bunch of um, faculty who participate in BIRD. We have um, you know, people at Princeton, NJIT, and Rutgers, and with a wide variety of expertise um, you know, from demography to machine learning to clinical trials and epidemiology. So there's a lot of um, faculty who are involved who can um, provide support depending on what the need is. Uh, we also have our BIRD staff, which, you know, since it's a service center, they really do the bulk of the work. Um, Patricia Greenberg is our manager. She, her photo is second from the left over here. Um, and Tracy Andrews, a biostatistician full time on the far left in that photo. Um, and then we, this picture is a little dated because we haven't been able to get together in person. This, um, to the right of me are the two students who we who worked with us previously at the earlier part of the year. And then now we currently have three student um, employees uh, who also do a lot of work with, um, for us. So that's uh, who we are. And um, our aims, uh, we have three main aims here. So one is providing you know, support on the research side of things for design and analysis support. We also wanna uh, promote development of innovative design, uh, study design and statistical methods. And then we also wanna provide um, educational opportunities. Uh, so I'll talk briefly about our progress on those and where we're, um, what we're doing going forward. So in terms of um, our progress in terms of research support, basically if you want to, if you, if you need Biostat support, you can reach us through the Bird Navigator, the, through our website, you can, uh, it's a very short form to fill out, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, and then, you know, somebody, typically Patricia will contact you within um, 24 hours. And um, so basically we have an initial meeting with you um, to find out more about your project, what your needs are. Uh, and that will, uh, then we can sort of um, use that as a way to get the right person to work with you. So. Uh, what's the scope of the project, um, what expertise is needed, you know, and th that sort of thing. And then we can play kind of matchmaker and make sure you have the right kind of support. Uh, so that's usually what that initial consultation involves. Uh, we also like you to fill out this form because we record it, we capture it in REDCap. So we're obsessed with capturing everything that we do. So um, it'll make, it makes it easy when we need metrics, you know, at the end of each year. Uh, so we love to capture everything that we're doing. Um, we've been supporting research um, throughout uh, throughout the Rutgers, NGIT, and Princeton. Um, a lot of different schools and clinical departments. We're listing some of them, but we've you know been involved with over 100 projects um, so far, um, and we're capturing all of it. Um, so you can see specifically if you want to know if somebody from your department has, if you've had any collaboration with us in your department, you can contact us. We can let you know. Um, but we want to you know we'd love to keep expanding this. And this is um, really just a partial list. Um, just as one quick example of the kind of things that we're able to do or have done, you know, we've provided a lot of support um, on COVID-19 research. One example is with the um, Rutgers Coronavirus Cohort Study. The, um, uh, the BIRD staff here really uh, built out the data capture tools and REDCap uh, was heavily involved with, you know, all of the things that, that are involved with that, you know, not just capturing the data, but providing alerts and you know helping to send out letters and things like that. But then also, as we capture data, then to also work on data analysis, um, it's led to several publications. It's also led to led to successful grant applications. Um, but so that took um, a lot of a lot of time. But it, you know, as, as as Ray mentioned, you know, this study uh, got off the ground with very little lead time, and we're able to roll enroll. You know. Um, hundreds of people, um, and so that involved a lot of, um, you know, the time of our staff. But I think it also shows um, the the skill and the commitment of of the staff to be able to get this off the ground, working with this whole, um, what we call RCC, this whole team to pull this off. Um, and so, and then another one we were involved with was a Robert Johnson screening screening study, similar in terms of. Um, needing to you know help develop the data capture tools and um, carry out some data analysis and led to a publication. We've also been involved with RADx up and other um, studies that have gone out, some clinical trials. Um, so COVID-19 research has been a big part of what BIRD has been doing over the last 
say six months. Um, and I think as we've also been pretty heavily involved with uh, on the red cap side of things, doing the data management and, and we've kind of discovered through, um, it, it's kind of come to be through word of mouth. I think that there's a big demand for this, um, you know, throughout NJX. And so we've been, you know, a lot of people, quite a few people have contacted us to possibly, you know, um, take care of the red cap data capture aspect for their study. So this is, I think a growing area that BIRD's going to be doing um, is really helping on the data management side of things. Um, then moving to, um, as far as AIM-2, um, promoting um, innovative methods. We, so we have our mini methods grant program. Um, so far we've funded four um, applications, so what four grants, and these are uh, the, the four that are listed here. And then you'll see that they cover a variety of areas um, from uh, gene regulatory networks, um, missing data and HIV, um, these kinds of precision, precision medicine trials, um, and then some neuroimaging work. Um, and we have a current call for application, so we're expecting to fund a couple more uh, before this year is out. And it, you know, and with everything we do, we'll be following up and um, seeing. It, you know, hopefully these all lead to NIH grant applications, and we'll be tracking that um, so we can continue to um, improve what we do. And then in terms of AIM-3, which has to do with education, we've been focused on primarily on workshops. We had originally done some in person, um, but we've switched now to doing it remote. But whether we do them in person or remote, we also record them. We have a Canvas page. Anybody can sign up to be part of this Canvas page and watch the recordings. Um, so we've had five workshops to date. We do Qualtrics surveys um, after each one. Our Canvas page has almost 400 people that are enrolled in it now um, from all over the place. So we also know where people are from based on their email address. And um, this is just a little screen capture of part of the page, you know, we, where we've had introduction to bi some biostats and epidemiology. We, we have um, a session on randomized trials and so on. And we've, um, and so anybody can go back and rewatch these or watch them for the first time. So you don't necessarily have to be available to watch these live. Um, you can, um, sign up to be part of this Canvas page and watch them at any time. We have, we're have we planning to do another probably four workshops over the next um, few months, um, probably covering uh, things like um, software like R and um, R Shiny, along with um, adaptive trials and possibly a little bit more on um, REDCap. So our future plans, um, we want to expand kind of how people can access our support service. So uh, we have the standard portal, which we would like to actually be more focused on bigger projects. Um, but we also are working on developing, uh, we haven't launched this yet, but something in micro, Microsoft Teams where somebody, this would be more for very short kinds of um, quick questions. Like sometimes people just say, oh, my code isn't, my SAS code isn't working. Could somebody just take a quick look at it? Or, um, you know, just they want to run something by us. Just a very fast question, and for that we want to involve um, our broader, our, our broader community of um, students and people like that who could get involved with just answering quick questions. And then our standard portal would be more for the bigger support, where uh, you know you want help with the data analysis, or you have grants going out, or anything like that. So we're trying to have multiple ways that you can work with us. So that should be coming soon. We, as I mentioned, we'll have new workshops. Um, we need to expand our team so we have an add-out we're trying to hire. I think we, we could really double our team, to be honest, and, and still um, have everybody busy. So, um, the, which is, it's good where there's a lot of demand for biostat support um, and our staff are probably overworked at the moment. So we're trying to expand and hopefully get to um, a, a better sort of level um, in the near future. Um, and, you know, I think one area of growth, as I mentioned, is really on the sort of data management side of things. We've discovered that there's a lot of um, demand. Uh, so I think we'll see us expanding more into this area and that will, have, that will also be strategic as we hire people. Uh, so that's a quick rundown. Um, if you want to um, work with us, you can, you can visit our website. You can also contact me, contact Patricia, um, and we can talk to you um, about um, working together. So I can stop there and take any questions.
Jason, wonderful, uh, wonderful job team. Uh, it really shows sort of the interactiveness. It's amazing. Yesterday I gave uh, medical grand rounds to the 14 hospitals simultaneously and uh, mentioned and offered the availability of BIRD and biostatistics. The, the talk was on CTSA. And it was amazing how many people chatted to me that I've never heard about the CTSA. Bob, uh, it, does that sound familiar to you? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if, if people listen and don't hear or don't hear and don't listen, but I don't know. I, I mean, we're there and Jason, you're capturing the data. It's hard to argue with data. Uh, I, I'm thrilled that this is really a window dressing for the CTSA because everyone needs stats and everybody doesn't know how to get it. And sometimes erroneously click on things until they get a p-value of 0.05 and say, aha, I am statistically significant. Absolutely <laughs> the wrong way to do it. Um, so Bob, you heard three cores. Any comments from you? Um, uh, it seems like you're, you're dealing with a lot of the same sort of challenges, but you, you I did have one question for the bird folks is one of the challenges we have with bird is it's transitioning people from the sort of initial consult to a longer term relationship and and the assumption of some PIs that well bird will do the stats and manage the data for all of us for all 3000 faculty you know forever and so I was sort of curious how you make that transition because um, I've had lots of nasty emails about that. Yeah, so, so let me translate Bob's term into something that's granular. What's the business model? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we, we kind of, yeah, we get, we have these challenges on both sides of things. Sometimes people reach out to us um, at the last minute and want us to sort of do some kind of rescue, but then they sort of act like they don't want to work with us again. So you get that kind of extreme where it's just like emergency, our paper keeps getting rejected. They keep criticizing the stats, write a little, you know, help fix up our stat section for us, which is not really what we want to do. Um, so we get that, but we also get the other people who do want to work with us and they have a big team of researchers and they want to take a lot of our time and we might not have that much time available. So that's, both sides are an ongoing challenge, but um, our model really is, um, you know, we, we can use the um, the grant itself, this the CTSA grant, to provide sort of lower cost support in terms of hourly. Um, and then, but with, uh, the ideal situation is for at least for people who are applying for grants is you know um, we we work with you on your grant, um, you write us into your grant for effort, and um, we don't you know we don't charge for that time of course to work on the grant proposal. And then if it gets funded, we work with you. And as our staff or faculty time sort of starts to get filled up where we can't then support the rest of it, then that's the time to hire more people. That's basically um, how we envision things going. Things got a little crazy the last six months because we the demand increased dramatically because of COVID and we couldn't respond as fast with hiring new staff. Um, so we're trying to play catch up right now, but that's basically where we are. Um, but it is, a, it is a challenge because um, um, the groups who are, you know, who work with us and are happy with us, and they they sometimes have a very, you know, big department with lots of people who want to work with us, um, and it's hard to necessarily have the capacity to do that. But then we get the other people where we're trying to change the culture, where they might just want to come to us in emergencies, and we want to get rid of that mentality and really have, we really want to have partnerships where we're collaborating, um, you know, and make the science better. Great. One of our bird guys at University of Georgia is very brave. He has open office hours online for like two hours or three hours once a week. And uh, I consider that a brave, perhaps suicide mission uh, <laughs> because it's really challenging. Well, you, know, you can't answer all the calls if they're in series. Yeah. <laughs> That's the good news. It's one at a time. Great job. There's no argument that that bird is serving, a, is doing a service for the ecosystem. So thank you. Let's transition.